All right. Well, good morning. Turn that down a little. Um, so today's uh, top, uh, today's subject uh, is uh, linear models too. We're returning to the subject of linear models, um, but it's a bit of a misnomer because we're going to look at how to learn nonlinear functions using linear models. Uh, we've seen a little bit of that already. Uh, this is what we uh, looked at, I think, uh, one week ago, maybe two. Uh, no, one week ago, we saw the idea that if you have a linear model, but you um, add some extra features, which are functions derived from the features you, alre you already had. In this case, we have the features d and p, and we add the feature d times p. And we learn a linear function on this extended feature space. Uh, that in the original feature space, in the 2D feature space you see here, you can actually learn nonlinear functions. You can learn circles and you can learn XOR data sets and stuff like that. Um, so today's lecture is about two models that build on this principle, namely uh, neural networks on the left. Oh, there's an animation here. Neural networks, which, uh, well, uh, a specific kind of neural network called a feed-forward feed network, which you can think of as a model that takes one of these linear models, in this case the, uh, the sigmoid model, and just sticks a learnable feature extractor uh, below it. So in this case, we're not just blowing up the feature space, space arbitrarily with randomly or arbitrarily chosen functions. We're actually putting a learnable feature extractor below it, which is just one way of looking at neural networks. And the other one is uh, support vector machines. And support vector machines are uh, famous because they, they can be used with something called a kernel trick, which allows you to put a kernel between the features and your linear model. And the kernel uh, basically does what we've been doing sort of manually and arbitrarily, this blow up to a, huge, to a larger feature space. The kernel can do that very um, efficiently and blow up to a huge feature space without incurring much more computation. So it's called the kernel trick. Uh, it's not usually learnable, so this is sort of a non-learnable feature extractor, and this is a learnable feature extractor. Um, so in that sense, we're looking at uh, this sort of uh, looking back at these linear models, but really seeing how far we can push this idea of expanding the feature space to make these linear models more powerful. There is the plan. We'll start by explaining what a neural network is. Focusing specifically on these kinds of feed-forward neural networks. There are many other kinds which we will uh, talk about at length in other, other lectures, but we'll start with this kind of uh, very basic neural network. And neural networks rely on a specific type of um, uh, a specific method to compute the gradient called backpropagation. Which basically means once we know backpropagation, we don't have to manually work out and derive all these gradients anymore. So that's sort of good news. And then after the break, we will move to support vector machines, uh, which includes this uh, third lo loss function that I promised you called hinge loss. And then we'll discuss this kernel trick, which makes um, support vector machines so much more powerful. Because uh, without the kernel trick, it's just a linear model. But with the kernel trick, suddenly you get this uh, explosion of power. Uh, it's kind of a packed lecture. There's a lot, a lot of different things to discuss if you have limited mental energy today or when you're reviewing you have limited time, I would recommend that you focus on the first half. Because as interesting as the second half is, um, within the course it's a bit of a dead end. We will talk once about support vector machines and we won't really return to it. So it's nice to know and it's an important model to know. Uh, but everything we talk about in the first lecture is going to come back next Monday and then again after that and again and again. So this is really a starting off point for uh, a large part of the rest of the course. So if you have to divide your mental energy, try and focus on the first half. <coughs> um, oh yes, and uh, we're, doing, we're discussing this chronologically. 
uh, hence the year, years here. So in the late 80s, early 90s, neural networks were very popular. Uh, a lot of people researching them, a lot of people using them and, and trying them out, and using the techniques that I'm going to talk about today. Uh, and in the 90, early 90s, they sort of died out a little bit, or interest died out a little bit. And they were largely replaced by support factor machines, to the extent that supposedly neural network conferences that had neural in the name were largely devoted to support vector machines. The whole field of machine learning was basically studying support vector machines and kernel methods. Um, and then 10 years later, around 2005, it started to flip back, flip back around again. So support vector machines died out a little bit and neural networks came back in a big way and gave rise to this deep learning revolution that everybody's talking about. Uh, so we'll sort of today we'll discuss the history right up to the deep learning revolution. And we'll see why the, the demands of the day and the hardware of the day sort of demanded that we, that this kind of thing happens, that um, why these kinds of models were popular at the time they were popular at. But first we have to go even further back to the very sort of genesis of neural networks. Uh, so this is early, uh, sort of no, late 50s, early 60s. Uh, people were just starting to think about AI and starting to think about the problem of learning at all, using very, very simple computers. And one very obvious thought was, well, we have one example of a, an, intelligent learn, uh, an intelligent system that is capable of learning, and that's our brain. So let's look at what our brain is made of and see if we can maybe replicate those things in the computer, maybe simplify them a little bit and see what they can do, and if that helps us a little bit. Uh, which led people to the neuron. This is a neuron, a brain cell. A neuron is a very simple little machine that has multiple inputs, which are called dendrites. So those are these things here, sort of feeding in signals from other brain cells. And then inside the cell, a tiny little bit of very simple processing happens, and it sends out one signal. So it gets multiple signals in, one signal out, which goes out through the exon. And then that signal, the exon branches out so that that single signal can go to multiple other brain cells. So multiple inputs, one output. That's the basic design of a neuron. And so people uh, knew this and they decided to uh, create a very simplified version of this and see if they could stick it into a computer and make it learn something. And that led to the perceptron, which is, uh, looks like this. So basically we have our inputs, which in this case we're just using a single neuron at this point as a classifier. So the inputs are just our features. Uh, and we multiply each input with a weight, which is what we're going to learn. And we have a separate input called a bias node, which is an input that is always set to 1, which is also multiplied by a, a parameter called the bias. So we multiply these things, sum them up, and we get an output value y. And then if y is bigger than 0, we say it's some class, and if y is smaller than zero, we say it's some other class. And that's the perceptron. Uh, incidentally, this video I showed you uh, at the, in the very first lecture, uh, that was actually a video of the perceptron. So the guy at the controls literally showing pictures to the computer. Uh, that was the, how, how it was done in those days. Um, so that basically leads to this function, which by now you should recognize as just being a linear model. This is just nothing more than the linear classifier that we've been talking about already. Uh, so what, once you take this neuron, once you simplify it enough, it really just becomes a linear, uh, a linear model, a linear classifier. And this already worked pretty well for the day. You know, as you saw in the video, it can sort of recognize, uh, recognize males, uh, men from uh, women in, in uh, videos. But the interesting thing about the brain is not the way a single neuron works, it's the way a big bunch of neurons work together. It's a complexity from a lot of uh, simple building blocks. So what you really want to do is take one of these perceptrons and build them into a network. Make this output the input of another perceptron and chain these things together. Uh, now if you try to do that, naively you run into a problem. If you try to compose neurons or perceptrons, um, 
because they're linear function, it's functions, and any time you compose two linear functions, the result is another linear function. So what we have here is three perceptrons, two input perceptrons composed, making the input of another perceptron on top here, uh, which gives you this function at the bottom here. And if you work this out, if you just uh, move this one and this two inside the brackets, you get this, very simply, which shows you that basically you have just another perceptron. All you've done is you've built this little two-layer network, sort of reduces back down to just one perceptron with four inputs. So you haven't given it extra power. You haven't given it the power to learn nonlinear functions or to learn exciting things, uh, because it's still just linear. And in order to make a network of perceptrons learn nonlinear functions and learn more interesting functions than any single perceptron could, we have to introduce a little bit of nonlinearity. Uh, the animations are slightly screwed up here, so I'll just go to the full slide. And the most popular way of doing this is with the sigmoid function. Ignore what's at the bottom here. It's with the sigmoid function, which we've seen already. We've seen, we saw this in the last lecture, this um, logistic sigmoid function, which is just an S-curve, which takes the whole range of numbers from negative infinity to positive infinity and squeezes them into the range between 0 and 1. And symbolically, it looks like this. And all we do is we take the regular perceptron, we compute it as before, we multiply the inputs by the weights, we sum the whole thing up, and then that one number, that summed up number, we pass through our nonlinearity. So nonlinearity is always a simple function from one scalar to another scalar, and it's always applied to this summed up output of the perceptron. And basically what you get is perceptrons that get an input that can cover this whole space between positive and negative infinity, but their output is always between 0 and 1. So it's always blown up and squeezed down, and then blown up again and squeezed down. Uh, and that's sort of how the sigmoid uh, functions. There's also the ReLU, which maybe we'll talk about a little bit uh, more next lecture, which is more linear. It's almost just a, a linear function, except any negative value is set to 0. So it's a much more simple function. And it sort of turns out that this also works, uh, but we won't go into why exactly. And the ReLU is a relatively modern invention, so since we're staying in the late 80s, early 90s, let's stick with the sigmoid and see how we can now take a bunch of these perceptrons with nonlinear activation functions, as they're called, and now we can chain them together into a network and see what that network can do. And to keep things simple, we will chain them together in a very straightforward way, what's called a feed-forward network, or a multi-layer perceptron. So we will just chain them together in layers. Which is to say we have one hidden layer, consisting of what are called hidden units. And each hidden unit is one perceptron on all of the inputs. Uh, so every hidden unit is connected to all of the inputs, but not to none of the other hidden units. And then on top of the hidden unit, we have one other perceptron, which uh, becomes the output layer. And for now, we'll just focus on neural networks that have just one output. Uh, although you can have multiple outputs as well, multiple nodes in your output layer. And that's called a feed-forward network. It's just one way to arrange percept uh, a network of perceptrons in a way that is sort of manageable and that allows you to, to turn it into a learning system. Uh, And now we can do regression or classification. Did I forget something? Oh yeah, so um, every orange or blue arrow in this diagram is one number, which is a parameter of the network. So on every line here, it has a number, and tuning these numbers, choosing these numbers, that determines the behavior of the network. And by tuning these numbers, we adapt the network to our learning problem. We learn by adapting these numbers, which we're going to talk about later at backpropagation with when we get to backpropagation. Uh, but first, let's look at how we take one of these feedforward networks and turn it into a classifier or a regression model. Um, so regression is pretty simple. Basically, it's doing what I've already showed you. You um, 
get this two-layer network. Incidentally, you can have more than two layers, uh, or more than one hidden layer. Uh, but throughout this period that we're talking about now, the late 80s, early 90s, people usually only had networks of one hidden layer, because for deeper networks, we didn't really know how to train them very well, uh, which was a big drawback of neural networks and, and held things back for a long time. Uh, so for now, we'll just stick with networks with just the one hidden layer. Uh, with these nonlinearities on top to make it a nonlinear function. And then on top of that, you just stick one output node with no activation. Because we're doing plane regression, so we want the output to take any value between negative and positive infinity. Uh, so we don't stick an activation on the uh, output layer. And then we can just apply any regression loss function that we like. So we can just uh, feed some, uh, some information to the network, show it an example, compute the network, figure out what it says, compare that to what the output should have been, compute the error, maybe square it, or uh, take some other loss function. And then based on that error, we're going to learn. We're going to learn to minimize that error, which we'll get to later. But that's basically how you set up a neural network to do a regression for you. And basically, this is what I was talking about earlier. These two layers correspond to what I was saying earlier. So we have basic, a basic linear regression layer here. This part of the model is just doing linear regression, but on these inputs, on, these, uh, on, the, the, on top of the hidden layer instead of directly on the inputs. And the first layer is just we can think of as a kind of feature extraction. So it takes our feature space and it blows it up to a larger space. And in this larger space, hopefully, our uh, regression problem becomes uh, something we can fit with a linear model. Or, as we'll see with the classification, our classification problem becomes, hopefully, linear, linearly separable. So we have a feature extraction just like we did before, except now we are training both the feature extractor and the linear model together in one go. So let's look at classification. Uh, change is very simple. All we do is we stick one uh, more sigmoid activation on the output layer as well. So now the output of the network is between 0 and 1. So if we show it an instance, put it on the input layer, and compute something, the network will give us a value between 0 and 1, which we can interpret, as we did on Monday, as the probability that the thing we showed it is positive. So there's two cl a binary classification, two class classification. And now we can just take these probabilities and apply cross-entropy loss, which we saw on Monday, and then use, tune these weights using our learning algorithm until the cross-entropy loss is as low as we can get it. If you have multi-class classification, so if you have more than, one cl uh, more than two classes, uh, you can't do it with just one node. And what we do is we, what we use is something called the softmax activation. Basically, for every class that we have, we create one output node. So this is a three-class classification problem. And then we add an activation function that ensures that the numbers that come out always sum to one. So what comes out is something we can interpret as a probability distribution over the classes. So there's a 10% probability that it's the first class, 60% that it's second class, and 30% that it's the third class. And again, on top of this, we can apply cross-entropy loss, because we have the correct label. So we just compare this probability distribution to the correct label, apply cross-entropy loss, and use that to train, try to minimize the cross-entropy. Um, and this is what softmax activation looks like. So if we have the output, the linear output of the nodes, if we, uh, which looks like this, call that OI, then we just exponentiate the uh, values on the nodes, because uh, taking the exponent makes sure that it's positive. So then uh, once we've taken the exponent of all three, all three values are positive, and then we just normalize them. So we just divide every value by the sum of all three values. That's called softmax activation. So that's how to do regression and classification using neural networks, or at least how to build the model. So now the question is, once you have this loss function, once you feed forward your network and you get some loss, you, get some, you compare it to what the output should be, you get some loss, how do we use that loss 
to train the weights of the neural network. Now, the basic principle we use is gradient descent. So this is just a complicated function, so it has a gradient. So we can just do a gradient descent with a couple of changes. And the first one is that we um, usually don't compute the loss over the whole data set. We actually, because that uh, gets quite expensive with the neural network, right? we're building bigger and bigger models. So it gets more and more expensive to do this single forward pass. So computing the whole loss over the whole data set is quite expensive. It's quite a big step to do for just one step of gradient descent. And we need to do a lot of steps of gradient descent. So what we do instead is something called stochastic gradient descent, where we pick just one example in our data set, and we compute the loss over that one example. So instead of taking the cross, uh, the, uh, let's say the square, uh, the, the square loss, over the whole data set, we just take the square loss of one example with its uh, uh, true label. And then we do a single step for that one example. So we optimize the model using that step for just that one example. And then we loop through the data set. And once it's full pass through the data set, it's called an epoch. And then we do a number of these epochs. And hopefully, then the model will converge to a, a, good, uh, a good model. Uh, so if you just uh, if you need to to compute the loss with respect to one example, it's just you can just imagine if you uh, you can just imagine what your loss would look like if your dataset only had one example. So if this sum that you get in your loss function reduces to just one term, and that's your loss function for stochastic gradient descent. It's called stochastic gradient descent. Stochastic means sampling, means probabilistic stuff. Um, it's called stochastic gradient descent because it's like your sampling one instance from your data distribution every time you want to do an update. The effect of stochastic gradient descent is that your uh, every step becomes, in effect, less accurate, because you're looking at just one example, so you're probably overfitting to or um, focusing too much on one example. You don't have this nice smoothing out of your whole data set. So every single step that you take is, is much more random and much, more accu uh, much less accurate. But you can take many more steps because they're so quick to compute. So on average, if you uh, adjust your learning rate accordingly, the average over those many steps that you take will usually turn out to be just as accurate as if you had used uh, normal gradient descent. And another advantage of stochastic gradient descent is that it, include, it, it um, creates a little randomness. Because every time you see a new instance, your uh, gradient is going to jump a little bit to a slightly different direction. And that randomness can help you escape local minima. So those are the main benefits of stochastic gradient descent. Uh, usually, you use a kind of trade-off in between. You use something called mini-batched gradient descent, where instead of training on just one example, you train on a couple of examples, like 32 of them, in one go. Uh, we'll look at that a little bit more in next lecture. For now, we'll just stick with stochastic gradient descent, one example at a time. So that's the basic way of training a neural network. You get some examples of input and output, just like you do in any machine learning setting. You decide on what your loss function should be. You work out the gradient of the loss with respect to the weights, which we'll talk about a little bit more later. And then you use stochastic gradient descent to improve the weights bit by bit. Uh, and we can actually see, go back to the TensorFlow playground and add some more features to it and see what that looks like. So now what you can see compared to the uh, previous uh, playground is that we've added a hidden layer. So now this is a neural network with the features feeding into a hidden layer and the hidden layer feeding into the output, and we're doing classification. So let's just see, first of all, what that looks like for the XOR function. And as you can see, we're doing probabilistic classification, so we're getting probability distribution over the classes. So there's a little white area here where it's not quite sure what it should do. Uh, 
It doesn't seem to be doing so well on this problem. Oh yeah, there it is. It's, uh, things are always a little bit slower with sigmoid activation. So you can see that it's slowly curving towards the correct shape. Um, so let's look at this other activation function. Instead of a sigmoid, let's use a ReLU activation. I can't see, is it the ReLU? Oh no, it's the top one. And we'll talk about why this is later, but as you can see, the ReLU sort of fits a lot quicker. Uh, what you can also see is that the sigmoid activation creates a kind of uh, curvy decision boundary, whereas the decision boundary of the ReLU activation is kind of piecewise linear. Uh, yeah, we had a question? Oh, uh, yeah, so epoch is... Um, so basically, every learning step is one, uh, uses one example from your data, right? So what you're doing is you're looping over the data set, looking at one example at a time. And once you've done a full pass over your data set, that's one epoch. So by now, it's done 1,000 passes over the whole data set, which is not a very big data set, but that's what an epoch is. Uh, let's look at the circular data set just to make this a bit more clear. So when you see the sigmoid, first of all, which may take a while, but you see that it is learning a kind of curve. Ah, it's, it's a little bit quicker this time. So it's learning quite a curvy decision boundary, whereas the ReLU, because the ReLU itself is, this has this piecewise linear shape, the decision boundary also becomes piecewise linear, in this case a kind of hexagon. So you can play around with this, and you can try uh, something I recommend trying is adding some extra hidden layers and seeing how much, on the one hand, it makes the model a bit more powerful. You can learn more complicated functions. But on the other hand, what you will see is it also makes the model a lot more difficult to train, uh, which gives you a sort of a hint about the deep in deep learning and why that's so special, uh, which is my lecture. This is the, no, that's the wrong one, isn't it? Oh, it's over here. There we go. So now the question is, as these models get more and more complex, how do we compute the gradient? Because as you saw already, um, even with these very simple linear models, it can be quite challenging and it requires quite a lot of uh, calculus to work out the gradient. Even for the thing we did on Monday, we had quite a complicated slide where we worked out the gradient of the uh, logistic regression. Uh, and that's doable, but after a while it stops being doable. So even for a, a neural network you can probably do it, but we're going to make these things more and more and more complicated, so we need a way to make the computer help us work out this gradient so that we don't have to do it ourselves. Oh, let me take off the uh, thing. So we've discussed neural nets, and we're starting backpropagation now. Uh, so the question is, how do we uh, make the computer work out this gradient? Well, we can make the computer do what we do on pen and paper. I mean, that's a very mechanical process, so you can program a computer to do that as well, right? Um, that's called symbolic differentiation. Problem is, that's very expensive. That sort of grows, potentially that grows exponentially, the cost of doing that. You can do it numerically, which is sort of what we did with the random search. So you sample a couple of um, points around your current point and you fit a hyperplane through it, for instance, which is basically what the, this uh, branching random search does. Um, but that's a little unstable and it's a little unprecise. And it's basically reducing us to using random search when we had this nice gradient, which we can work out symbolically. So we want the precision of uh, working things out symbolically, but we want it to be cheap. And that's where backpropagation comes in. And the basic idea of backpropagation is that if you describe your function as a composition of modules, a composition of functions, so you pass your input to one function and you pass the output of that through another function and the output of that through another function, then the uh, the, um, taking the derivative of that function 
boils down to just repeatedly applying the chain rule. And that can help us a lot. Because then you're just looking at the product of the derivative of each model with respect to its arguments. So here's the backpropagation algorithm, which became popular in the, well, it was invented, nominally invented, it was repeatedly invented a couple of times, but the official invention is, uh, no, is uh, I think, 1974, and then throughout the 80s it was used a lot in the early 90s. Um, basically, you take whatever model you have, it doesn't have to be a neural network, you break it down into a chain of modules, and then you work out the derivative of each model with respect to its input symbolically. So there you do the writing uh, and you work things out symbolically on pa with a pen and paper and then whatever you get you stick into the computer. But then once you have that, you compute the global gradient for a given input by multiplying these gradients. So once you have these symbolic gradients worked out, then you switch to numeric computation and then you work out what the gradient is for a specific input by working out these uh, uh, subgradient, these, these uh, module gradients and multiplying them. Uh, if you don't get it, don't worry, I have an example for you. So we'll start with just a very simple function, much simpler than a neural network, just to show you the, the idea. So let's say we have just an arbitrary function I just pulled out of the air. And we're going to uh, not work out, we could work out what the derivative of this one is, but instead we're going to break it up into modules and use the backpropagation algorithm. So first, this is basically, this function is the composition of these modules. So we take the negative of x, whatever that is, we exponentiate it, and we take the sine of that, and then we take two over that. So this is a sort of sequence of steps that together create our function. Our function fx is just uh, this sequence of functions composed, uh, which we can also represent as what's called a computation graph. So basically we have a couple of modules and they take an input and they pass it on to the next module. Uh, and at the end of that pipeline is our output. So now what we can do is we can take this uh, composition of uh, functions and we can apply the chain rule. So fx is d with this argument, so it, uh, and then applying the chain rule is uh, breaking this apart into two factors, namely the derivative of d with respect to its argument, and then the derivative of that argument with respect to whatever, whatever we were taking the derivative with respect to. Uh, and to get rid of the brackets and to clarify the notation a little bit, we'll just ignore the argument. We know what the argument is for each function, so we'll just not write it down, and we will write the uh, applying the chain rule to this in this way. So we take the derivative of d with respect to c, and then multiply it by the derivative of c with respect to x. And then we can break c over x up in the same way, which gives us c over b times b over x, and b over x we can break up in the same way, which gives us b over a times a over x. So this is what I meant when I said it all boils down to repeatedly applying the chain rule. And the derivative of d over x now becomes very simple, this product. And that's what we can use to do backpropagation. Uh, animations are a bit wonky again. So we have the function, we have broken it up into modules, which we can also see as a computation graph. We have used those modules and repeatedly applied the chain rule, which has given us this kind of uh, decomposition. Uh, and now, just a little nomenclature, we call this thing that we're actually interested in, we call the global derivative, it's just for the purpose of this lecture. And these little factors here, we call the local derivatives. So a local derivative of one of our modules is the derivative of the module with respect to its argument. Not with respect to the thing that was originally the input, but with respect to the argument of the module. So d with respect to c, that's the local derivative. And now backpropagation boils down to write down your function as a composition of modules, work out the local derivative symbolically, then we do a forward pass for a given input, so then we start doing numeric computation, so we, compute, we actually compute the function for some input x, 
and we remember all the inter intermediate values, A, B, C, D, uh, A, B, C, and D. And then we fill in these intermediate values in this gradient to work out the global derivative. So it looks like this. Uh, we work out the local derivatives symbolically. So each of these we can just look here, work it out. So the derivative of this uh, is uh, minus 2 over c squared. The derivative of the sine is a cosine. The, der the derivative of e to the power of a is e to the power of a, famously. e to the power of something is its own derivative. And then the derivative of minus x is just minus 1. So this is our derivative not reduced to a function of x, but kept as a function of these intermediate values. That's where we leave it. That's the extent to which we do it symbolically. Then we do a forward pass. So I've chosen the value for x minus 4.499 so that the rest of the numbers work out as round numbers, if you round off a little bit. Uh, so if you... Uh, Oh, sorry, x is, uh, yeah, x is minus 499. So then a becomes, uh, this is wrong, a becomes 499 because we take the negative of it. e to the power of 4.499 4 is 90. The sine of 90 in degrees is 1. And 2 divided by 1 is 2. So now we've done a forward computation of this, uh, of this function. And we remember all these intermediate values. Uh, and now we take these intermediate values and we stick them into our partially worked out derivative and compute the rest numerically, where we see that we get the cosine of 90 degrees, which is zero. So we have one zero in our product, so the rest also becomes zero. So actually for this function, the gradient is zero. So if we were trying to find an optimum, we've actually found it here. And that's backpropagation. Uh, let's have a look. Uh, and let's give you some time to digest that. Put the break here, and then after the break, we will uh, show you how to do backpropagation and how to apply this to an actual neural network. But we'll do that in 15 minutes. All right, uh, let's get started again. Uh, in retrospect, I probably could have squeezed this before the break. It's not actually that, uh, that much, but um, still it's nice to uh, go through it carefully. So we're going to talk about this backpropagation idea and how to apply it to a um, two-layer neural network with sigmoid activations. So here we have the two-layer neural network. And the first thing to recognize that is different from what we did before the break is that we are not looking at the derivative with respect to x, which is always a sort of sneaky trap that you always fall into, that you're taking the derivative of your model with respect to its input. That's not what we're interested in. We want the derivative of the loss function with respect to the weights, because we're training the weights, we're not training the input. So we're looking at the derivative of the loss function, which we'll call L, with respect to one of the weights in the top layer and one of the weights in the bottom layer. That's what we're going to look at. Uh, so let's uh, apply backpropagation. So we break our system into modules, which in this case correspond to the layers. So first we have the loss function, which is the output of the network y minus the target value squared. Then y is just a linear, because uh, uh, y is not, does not have an activation function or has a linear activation, so we just <laughs> multiply all the hidden values by their respective weights and add the bias. That's y. Then for each of these hidden values, we get one of these modules where we apply the activation function. So we take, we call uh, the linear uh, thing that goes into the activation function, we call h2 prime. We apply the activation function. This is just a sigmoid function. And that's h2. Then h2 prime is just all the inputs multiplied by their respective weights as they go into h2 plus the bias, uh, which is not specifically the bias of x. This should say something like b2, but uh, 
Forgive me for the minor mistakes. Uh, so those are our modules. Uh, so now we need to work out the local gradients of each of these modules with respect, of the, with respect to the arguments that we're interested in. Uh, so first we'll look at the loss of uh, the derivative of the loss with respect to V2 here. We don't have to go very deep into the network. That's just, there they are. Uh, that's just the derivative of L over Y, which is just if you work it out, uh, you can separate these two things using the chain rule. So then the two goes out in front. And this inside the square over Y is just uh, one. So you end up with just two times Y minus T. So it's basically just the two you can ignore so it's just the non-squared error. It's just an error with a direction, with a plus or a minus, how big the error is and in which direction the error is. And here we have y over v2, which is just a linear function, so we end up with just h2 as the derivative. And this is our derivative, which is actually should look familiar because it's, it's also the derivative of a linear function, linear regression. And if we apply this derivative, so uh, for, uh, first of all, if we now do backpropagation, we propagate it forward, and then we fill in these values that we've remembered from the forward pass, and then we get a value here, which we use for gradient descent. Um, so I won't show you all that, but first, but instead, let's look at what actually happens when we apply gradient descent to this parameter v2. So if we look at this, what gradient descent does to this parameter v2 in isolation, we see that it updates v2 by subtracting this value times some learning rate, right? Add as the learning rate to some small value to make sure that we don't make uh, steps that are too big. So we just subtract this value from v2, and that's our weight update for this, uh, for one step of the gradient descent algorithm. Um, so what we're seeing here, what we're subtracting from, a, from V2 is actually the error times the activation of H2. So to hopefully, well, maybe clear this up and maybe give you something to hang on to, let's give you an analogy of what the neural network does, of how you can think about this neural network. So we'll think of the neural network as a kind of government, which has the prime minister at the top who makes the decisions. And in order to make those decisions, he listens to his ministers uh, on the second layer each of you each of whom he trusts with varying degrees so the arrows the weights are the levels to which he trusts his ministers if he um, trusts them a lot so if he has positive trust then he will do more or less what they say or he will follow their advice if he has negative trust then he will do the opposite of what they say uh, and the ministers they don't tell him what to do per se, but they just shout, and the louder they shout, the higher he makes the value. So the value is maybe like, what should the tax on cigarettes be? And he listens to how loud the uh, ministers shout, because these are sigmoid activations, so they only get values between zero and one. So let's say they can shout very loud, which is one, or they can stay quiet, which is zero. And the minister interprets shouting very loud as the tax should be higher. And so if everybody stays silent, and he trusts them all positively, then he will go for a very low tax. It's a slightly contrived example, but hopefully it'll give you something to hang on to. And these ministers each listen to civil servants in the first layer, and they have the same sort of thing. They, have, they also have a level of trust, uh, so they can trust the civil servant and follow their advice, or mistrust the civil servant and do the opposite of what they say. So then something happens. We feed the information through the network. The prime minister makes a decision, looks at the consequences, and decides, actually, I shouldn't have done that. I should have done this instead. And so he looks at that error, and he's going to backpropagate it down the network. He's going to decide to adjust his level of trust uh, based on what he saw, based on how well it went. And he's going to tell his ministers how well they did so that they, in turn, can adjust their level of trust for their civil servants. So for just the first update, uh, this looks like this. So the, all the prime minister does is to update his level of trust. 
is to look at how badly things went, what the error is, and multiply it by how loudly the minister contributed to the, discuss to the discussion. Uh, so if, uh, let's say, y was too high, should have been lower, then this is a positive value. And if the uh, minister spoke very loudly, so told him to make the value high when it actually should have been lower, then this whole thing becomes a large positive value. So the trust in that minister is decreased. Whereas if the value was too low, then this, become negative, this becomes negative. And if the minister shouted very loudly, then the trust in the minister is increased. That's how the signs work out in this kind of thing. Uh, so now the second step, let's look at this uh, weight W12 here. See how, uh, how that's updated, uh, which means we need to go through one of these uh, sigmoid activations. So let's remind ourselves of the derivative of the sigmoid, which is just the output of the sigmoid times 1 minus the output of the sigmoid. So, and remember, 1 minus the sigmoid is just the sigmoid flipped uh, along this axis, which is the same as the sigmoid flipped along this axis. So if you multiply these two functions, you get the derivative of the sigmoid. It's basically a little peak here in the middle where it climbs very quickly and then flattens out to the sides where the sigmoid sort of flattens out. Uh, and we need that because we need to work out this, this chain of derivatives. So L over Y we've seen already. Y over H now becomes V2. So we, we're going to distribute the arrow through this uh, parameter V2 here. Uh, H over H prime is what I just showed you, is the derivative of the sigmoid. So which turns out, because H2 is the output of the sigmoid, we can just take H2 multiplied by 1 minus H2, and that's the derivative. And then the derivative of H pri H2 prime is, uh, since we're looking at 1, 2 here, is just X, uh, X1. Which means that our update rule looks like this. This is how we update the parameter W12. So what does that mean in terms of this uh, contrived analogy? Basically, it means that we take this global error, we compute the extent to which it was H2's fault by multiplying the level of trust of the prime minister. So this is sort of what, uh, well, this or this, depending on your perspective, but that's what the prime minister tells the minister. This is the extent to which it was your fault. So look at how, uh, look at how you came to your decision and uh, do better, or do the same thing. So uh, depending on what exactly what kind of network you have, this can also be negative. Uh, and then we need to account for this activation function, because if the civil servants are all shouting very loudly, so this activation is already maxed out, and we're in this flat region of the activation function, then changing things a little bit, changing the level of trust a little bit, isn't actually going to change the output of the prime minister very much. So we need to account for the activation function, or isn't actually, sorry, isn't actually going to change the output of the minister very much. Uh, so we need to account for the activation function. That's what's happening here. And then because we're looking at the level of trust of this civil servant, we are multiplying by just what the contribution of that civil servant was. And that becomes our update for this, the level uh, to which um, H2 trusts X1. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of insight in the way backpropagation works to take this arrow and propagate it back down the network to assign responsibility to all the weights for what, uh, what happened. So just a little summary. Uh, this was our first introduction to neural networks. They are basically a lot of linear, met, uh, linear functions with a little bit of nonlinearity mixed in, in places where it doesn't uh, make things too difficult for us. 
Uh, simplest version is a feedforward network. We'll see more complicated functions later. And we train it basically by the gradient descent that we've seen already, except that we make it stochastic gradient descent, so it works a bit quicker, and we get a little bit of the randomness. And for once, we don't have to work out the entire gradient anymore because we now have this backpropagation algorithm that allows us to work uh, out the gradient only locally and use that to do uh, gradient descent. Uh, so that's neural networks, and that's basically how we did AI or did machine learning in the 80s and 90s until the neural network winter happened, basically where funding and interest in neural network dried up, neural networks dried up. So why did that happen? Why, um, uh, yeah, why, why did people lose interest? Well, basically one very difficult problem with neural networks is that they're very hard to train. You have a lot of variables to work uh, with. You need to set this learning rate. You need to figure out how long to train. Uh, the loss during training can go up as well as down because your loss surface isn't convex. So you don't know, you don't have a guarantee that you're going to find this uh, a good optimum. Um, <clears throat> which doesn't just make it good to find a difficult model, it also makes it difficult to do research. If you've figured out your neural network model and you want to know if it works, you basically need to spend weeks and weeks and weeks tweaking all these parameters to see if one of these parameter settings works. Whereas with support vector machines, which we'll see, which we'll look at now, um, they have a convex loss surface. So once you've set up your support vector machine, you know whether or not it works immediately. You can just say, give me the best solution, and some model will find the best solution because it's a convex loss surface. You find the optimum, and you know whether or not it works. And so then you change your model, and you move on. But you have immediately sort of feedback so you can move on, whereas with neural networks, you're, you have a lot more uncertainty. Um, and there's lots of other reasons, why right? uh, It took a long time to get neural networks to work and to work comfortably. And in that time, <coughs> we, I'll skip this slide, in that time, we uh, moved our attention to support vector machines. So let's look at that now. Uh, so we go a step back <coughs> to the linear classifier. So we're back to just drawing a line over our feature space, looking at where that line intersects our feature space and calling that the decision boundary. Or in other words, executing this linear function, see if it, seeing if it's bigger or smaller than zero and uh, classifying accordingly. Here's what it looks like in 2D. Uh, so just uh, what we've been talking about a lot already. And the last time we looked at these linear models, this was the logistic regression model, we found a, a very good model. But we noticed uh, this, that if our classes are very linearly separable, then it has a lot of different models to choose from that do very different things. So these are both great margins, uh, sorry, great decision boundaries that separate the red and the blue classes very well. Um, and logistic regression doesn't really give us any, doesn't really have a preference over one or the other. Even though if you encounter a point here, it matters quite a lot which model you pick. So support vector machines allow us, support vector machines give us a solution to this. I basically say, here's the problem again. Uh, if we have this as a class, if we have this as a, a classification data set, then this is, a, in some sense, a perfect classification because it separates the class perfectly. Um, nope, sorry. But it doesn't look very well because if I find another red point like this, but very slightly to the right, it's suddenly classified as a blue point. <coughs> so basically, this is what we want to avoid, a line that really hugs one of the points in our data set very neatly. Or to put it another way, we want a line that has big margins to the nearest points. We want the line, we want to choose the line for which the space to the nearest uh, negative points and space to the nearest positive points is as big as possible. And that space we call the margin. Uh, and the points that the, that the margin hugs, the point that the margin, points that the margin just touches, we call the support vectors. 
We call them the support vectors because if I just give you the support vectors instead of the parameters of the line or the data set, all I give you are the support vectors. You can work out from that what the line is. <clears throat> There's only one line uh, for which the margins hit these three points. Um, so that's our that's basically the basic idea of our algorithm is that's the line we want to find. And that's why it's called a support vector machine because we phrase it in terms of these support vectors. So now we need to figure out how do we get this line and hopefully how do we work this into a loss function so that we can <coughs> find these line using the methods that we already know. Uh, and the first trick we use is to uh, set the, uh, to, to um, use a constraint to, to uh, ensure that the output for our model, so wx plus b, is minus one when it hits this line and plus one when it hits this line. So when it hits the positive support vectors, the output of our model, model should be one. And when it hits the negative support vectors, it should be minus one. And we can do this because we have this degree of freedom. If we have a data set here, and this is where we ideally want our uh, decision boundary to be, there are infinitely many lines that give us this decision boundary because we have this rotation. It's basically a uh, degree of freedom. So we just, out of those infinitely many lines, we just pick the one that hits the support factors at minus one and plus one. We just make that decision. That's the line that we're after. So now we can state this uh, support vector machine as an optimization objective. We can just say maximize the margin or two uh, times the size of the margin, which is the margin from the line to the positive uh, points, positive support vectors, plus the margin to the negative support vectors, so twice the size of the margin. Uh, we want to maximize that value, whatever it is. We're going to make that more precise later. But whatever that value is, we want to maximize it such that these constraints are true. So whatever we want to do whatever we can to make this as big as possible, but we also want to satisfy these constraints. So this is a constraint optimization objective, the first one we've seen so far. And this is just saying that, this is just stating the support factor thing. So all the positive points need to be either at one or above one. And in fact, those that are at one will be the support vectors. And the negative points need to be below one, <coughs> below minus one or at minus one. And the ones that are at minus one will end up being the support vectors. So this is just restating our uh, support machine, uh, support vector machine thing. So what we're doing is we want to maximize this while keeping these above one and these above, below minus one. Uh, and we can rewrite these, in, these two objectives into one objective by just introducing a label. So if we introduce a label, the same label actually that we used for the least squares classifier, label y that is one for positive points, yi that is one for positive points and minus one for negative points, and we multiply this thing by yi, then basically we get, uh, well here we're just, for positive points we're just multiplying by one, so nothing changes. And negative points, we are, if we multiply this by one, essentially what we're saying is that minus this should be bigger than one. So we just multiply the whole thing by minus one. Uh, so we can reduce these two objectives to one objective, which makes things a little bit neater. And it just, we've just introduced uh, a little uh, a parameter yi that encodes whether or not a point is positive or negative. So now, let's look at this part here, which isn't quite mathematical enough for us to implement. We want to maximize twice the size of the margin. So what is that? And the nice thing is that because we've set, because of the way we've defined this decision surface, we can state this entirely in terms of the parameters of the hyperplane without reference to exactly what the support vectors are. The constraints will take care of what the support vectors are, and as we will see, the support vectors will not actually end up in this uh, 
uh, this part of the objective. But we'll need to do a little bit of mathematics to work out what the size of the margin is. So this is, uh, this is the value we're interested in, the length of this line. And that's what we want to maximize. So we can make things a little bit easier for ourselves by just moving the axes around. The axes are now here. We just add a little bit to all the points, move the axes around. Size of the margin doesn't change, right? So we just say that the bottom of this line that we're interested in hits the origin. Uh, which gives us uh, I'm not sure what's happening here. Oh yeah, uh, so the uh, this two uh, m twice the size of the margin that we're interested in is the length of a, right? The length of the vector a because now a is a vector, uh, an arrow from the origin to this point here. So this is the value we're interested in, and we know that in, this new, in these new axes, we know that zero is a negative point because zero is on the negative margin. Uh, and this point A, whatever it is, is a positive point because it's on the positive margin. So if we apply those points, if we stick them into this uh, linear function, we know that zero, this is a zero vector, wt zero plus b sh uh, should be minus one because it's on the negative margin. And WTA plus B should be plus one because it's on this positive margin. So these two things we know, and we can now combine these things to see if we can work out what the length of A is in terms of the parameters of our model. Uh, the easiest thing to do is just to uh, take this side and subtract it from this side and take this side. So we take these two sides and we subtract it from these sides. So we do w a plus b minus w zero plus b and one minus minus one. So uh, one minus minus one is two. Uh, w zero is just zero because it's a zero vector. The dot product of a zero vector is zero. The two b's cancel out because we get b minus b. So we just end up with the dot product of w and a is two. And we know one more thing. Namely, that W and A point in the same direction. Because W, remember, is the direction in which the hyperplane rises quickest. Uh, so as I've drawn it here, an arrow orthogonal to the decision boundary. So they point in the same direction, A and uh, W. And we know this geometric definition of the dot product. So the magnitude of W, the dot product between W and X is magnitude of w times magnitude of x times the angle, the cosine of the angle between them. So the angle is zero, so the cosine is one, so that falls out. So we know that the magnitude of w times the magnitude of a is two, which means that if we move w to the other side, we get our answer. The size of the margin is equal to two over the magnitude of w. That's all we know. So now we know our objective is to maximize 2 over the uh, 2 divided by the magnitude of w such that the constraints hold. And because we like loss functions, we like things to minimize instead of things to maximize. Just to bring this in line with the standard language of machine learning, we flip it around. We take 1 divided by this thing. So we actually have something we can minimize. So we just take half the magnitude of w. We want to minimize that such that this constraint holds. And that will give us the uh, maximum margin decision boundary, the support vector machine decision boundary. Um, the slight problem, namely that if, we, um, if our data is not linearly separable, we cannot satisfy this constraint. So then we have no points in our model space that satisfy this constraint, so we can't start learning. So we need to slacken this a little bit. We need to add a little bit of slack to this. Uh, that allows the model to uh, violate this constraint in order to find a slightly better model, uh, a slightly better fit. So we add something called a slack parameter, which is called pi. So every point in our space has, uh, in our data, sorry, has one slack parameter associated with it, which is either zero or bigger than zero. And these are essentially parameters of our model. So if we set this parameter to zero for all our points, pi equals zero, 
then this falls away. Uh, this, uh, we can remove this and we just end up with our original model. Uh, because we've also added here, we have added a term C times uh, the sum over all these P's. So if P's are zero, then we get the original hard margin classifier that we saw earlier. But if for some points we make P bigger than zero, PI bigger than zero, then we allow a little bit of uh, violation of the constraint, which basically means that this point XI can be on the wrong side of the decision boundary. So the value is a little bit smaller than one. So it's inside the margin or even on the wrong side of the decision boundary. That's allowed, but we pay in our loss by this uh, PI value then. And C is a hyperparameter that says how much we care about these points that violate the, uh, that violate the constraint. Uh, so here's what that looks like. Let's say we have a data set here that is not linearly separable. So the only thing we can do is pick, or what we want to do is pick these two points, these open circles, as uh, support factors. So we get this line, this decision boundary. Then these values, this is a blue point that is not bigger than 1, bigger than or equal to 1. And this is a red point that is not smaller than or equal to minus 1. So we pay this penalty for these points expressed by the green, uh, the green line. Oh, something's gone wrong expressed by the green line. Uh, here's a slightly different problem. So this, uh, in some cases, even if you do have a linearly separable problem, you still want to use some of this penalty. So here we have, again, some support vector machines and some points that violate the constraints. So we get this soft margin, whereas if we use a hard margin classifier, these would have been the, these internal points would have been the uh, support vectors. And we would have ended up with just a tiny, tiny hard margin, which is slightly in the wrong place because this uh, uh, this margin, this decision boundary here, much is is much more realistic point to separate these two point clouds. Uh, so sometimes, even if you have a linear uh, model, uh, a linearly separable problem, you still want to use this uh, this soft margin with these penalties. So now we can do two things. We can uh, rewrite this in two ways. Either we express everything in terms of the parameters of the line and get rid of the constraints. We can do that. That's actually very simple. And that will give us a loss function for which we can compute a gradient, for which we can do gradient descent. Because gradient descent doesn't naturally deal with these constraints. So if we want to do gradient descent, we have to get rid of the constraints. And we can use for search a good model. And we can use this, for instance, as a loss, mo uh, loss function for use with neural networks. That's option one. Or option two, express everything in terms of the support vectors and get rid of W, which doesn't get rid of the constraint. So we have a constraint optimization problem. But if we uh, accept that we have to solve this constraint optimization problem and use different methods for that, we can use this kernel trick. Uh, so let's talk about option one first very quickly. Basically, if you rewrite the whole thing in terms of PI, you end up with this. Uh, so you can just rewrite this uh, constraint as a function of PI, because this PI, this penalty, is either zero for points that are on the right side of the margin, or this value for points that are inside the margin. Just take this PI and write everything around. So PI is equal to the max of zero or this value. And then you can just fill this into the function. And you get this single loss function, which we want to minimize, such that nothing. It's just a function that we want to minimize. This is called uh, hinge loss sometimes, because the function looks has this max in it, like a hinge. Um, and this is some, just some function that we can apply to, um, for instance, uh, make the law use as the loss function in a neural network. So that's very nice. You, you're not stuck to linear models. Um, it's not that popular. Uh, cross, cross entropy is a little bit more popular. But as far as I can tell, not for very good reasons. 
I think both of them perform roughly the same. Um, so that's basically our three loss functions that I promised. So we looked at least squared loss, log loss, last lecture, and now SVM loss or hinge loss. Uh, just a little summary slide. So you have the accuracy that doesn't uh, work at all with gradient descent, the least squares that doesn't really work very well. It's just a, sort of an example. Then the cross entropy loss, which works by applying this sigmoid to turn your points into to turn your predictions into probability values over the classes. And then we have this soft margin SVM, which maximizes the margin between uh, 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 from your decision boundary to the nearest points with these penalties. Uh, so it's a complicated slide, but something to look at if you want to uh, remind yourself what these uh, things were. Um, so that's basic SVM. So now let's look at this option two. We rewrite the loss function in a different way that doesn't get rid of the constraints, but allows us to apply this kernel trick. So here we go again with the original formulation of the soft margin uh, loss function with constraints. And um, I need to very quickly explain a trick that we use to rewrite functions like this with constraints. That trick is called uh, uh, the uh, method of Lagrange multipliers, Lagrange multipliers. So let's look at it in a simpler setting a little bit first. So let's say we have a function like this, just a, a simple parabola, fa is a squared, and we want to minimize it subject to this constraint. A should be bigger than one. Uh, the method of Lagrange multiplier is basically uh, what it does, it sets up a new loss function, L, uh, which has, uh, consists of the original minimization objective, plus for every constraint that we have, one extra term, which is the extent to which the constraint is violated, uh, multiplied by a scalar, alpha in this case. Uh, so this gives us a new single objective with no constraints, uh, except that this alpha has to be zero, so we're not getting rid of constraints, we're just getting different constraints. Um, and now it turns out that if you solve, if you uh, compute the gradient of L, if you work out the gradient of L, you set that equal to zero and you solve it, for both the original parameters and this alpha, that solution is equal to the solution of your constraint optimization problem. Uh, I really don't have time to give you the intuition for why that should be so, but at least a little visual intuition. This is basically the problem that I showed you earlier. So we've turned this original 1D function, shown by the line here, this parabola in A, into a surface with this other uh, alpha that shows you how much you are violating this uh, constraint that alpha should be bigger than one. And in this new surface, the optimal solution becomes a saddle point. So you get this, here you get an optimum, but it's not a minimum or a maximum, it's a saddle point. But it is a, a point where the gradient is zero. And that's also, incidentally, why we can't use gradient descent on these things, because gradient descent doesn't find saddle points. So if you use gradient descent, it's just going to go off into uh, infinity on this side, but we actually want to find the point where it's zero, the saddle point. Um, so that's all the intuition I can give you. For the rest, you'll have to just trust me on this. This is Lagrange, the method of Lagrange multipliers. You have some function that you want to minimize. You have some constraints that should be true. You add your constraints into your optimization function. You solve by setting the gradient to zero. And the solution of that system gives you a solution of your original uh, optimization objective. And this allows you to rewrite your constraint optimization problem, usually into a much simpler problem. So if you do this for your um, uh, soft margin SVM, what you do, what you get, starting out with this, is this. And during last year's lecture, I had a little bit more time because the neural networks were a little, uh, moved a little forward. So if you actually want to see how to get from this to this, uh, you can watch the 2018 version of this lecture. I'm going to skip it for today. 
So just trust me, if you do a lot of rewriting, this is exactly the same as this. And what we have here um, is we get a bunch of alphas. And these alphas is one alpha for every element in our data. We get these y's, which are the plus ones or the minus ones, depending on the class of the x. Then we get the dot product of a pair of points in our data set. And as you can see, we sum over all pairs of points in our data set. And then we penalize the size of these alphas. And that together is our loss function. Um, so yeah, that's all the intuition I can give you. So you'll just have to trust me that this works, that this actually describes a support vector machine. And the reason, the thing that allows us to apply this kernel trick is the fact that the whole thing is just phrased in terms of the parameters alpha. Note that there are no longer any parameters of the actual hyperplane. So the parameters just indicate, these alpha parameters just indicate which points in our data set are uh, support vectors. So if alpha is zero, that point is not a support vector. If alpha is bigger than zero, that point is a support vector. Um, and uh, all we need apart from that is the dot product of pairs of our data. All we need to compute this, uh, this version of the support vector machine is all the dot products of all the pairs of points in our data. So essentially, if I tell you I have a data set, I don't show, I don't show you what the data set is, but I do give you a big matrix of all the dot products in that, um, of all the dot products of all the pairs of points in my data, uh, then you can compute from that matrix the support vector machine, the optimal decision boundary. You can compute this algorithm. You can solve this minimization uh, function. Which leads us to the kernel trick, which, is, which says that if I can do that, if I can just give you the dot products, then maybe I can substitute them for other dot products. So dot products basically a kind of distance matrix. Maybe I can give you another distance matrix and make you, instead of uh, computing the support vector machine on the, for the original uh, dot products, you can compute this for my new dot products, which I've come up with with a different function. Uh, which we call a kernel function. So it needs to um, satisfy certain constraints in order to behave properly, but it's basically any function that computes the dot product of x and y, but not the actual dot product of x and y, but x and y expanded to a bigger feature space. So imagine that we did this manually, we expand x and y to a bigger feature space, then compute the dot products, and then on those dot products compute the support vector machine. Sometimes, for specific expansions to specific feature spaces, we don't actually have to compute these expanded feature vectors. We can just compute the dot product directly. So then we get a very efficient function called a kernel, which computes for us the dot product in a much higher dimensional space without the cost of actually projecting or transforming into that higher dimensional space. And then we just compute this on the kernel function instead of on the actual dot product. And for basically the same price as computing a linear model, we get a much more than linear model. So let's look at a, a simple example to make that a little bit more con concrete. This is one of the um, examples I showed you for when you don't know which features to add. One thing you could do is just add all cross products, right? So we have features x1 and x2. And all we do is just add x1 squared, x1 times x2, and x2 squared. And that already uh, massively blows up our feature space and allows us to fit much more powerful models. So let's try and illustrate, the, let's try and do that with a kernel. So we have two uh, points, A and B, uh, with two features, 1 and 2. And let's say we use this as our kernel. So we just compute the dot product of A and B, and we square that dot product. Uh, the result of that is not the dot product of A and B, because it's the squared dot product of A and B, but is it the dot product of some other vectors? Well, as it turns out, um, 
Yes, it is. This is equivalent to the dot product of A prime B prime if A prime and B prime are defined like this. Uh, so here we have these expanded features. We have A squared, uh, A1 squared, A2 squared, and up, uh, with multiplied by some constant, A1 times A2. Uh, and I don't have time to work it out on the blackboard, but basically if you take the dot product of this and you do a little bit of rewriting, it turns out to be exactly this function over A and B. Uh, making the generalizing that a little bit more, if you add a plus one, because here we are expanding to a, oh, sorry. Here we are expanding to a different feature space, but we are losing the original uh, features, which we don't want to do. So if we do the same thing, but we add a plus one, then we, it turns out you keep the original features as well. Uh, and then instead of uh, raising to the power of two, you can also raise to the power of three or to the power of four or five or whatever you want uh, to get not just the cross products of every two features, but also the three-way cross products of every three features, if you raise to the power of three, uh, plus all the two-way cross products. And if you raise to the power of four, you also get all the four-way cross products and five and six and so on. So this space gets very big very quickly. If you have a couple of features, if you raise to the power of 10, you get a huge, you're um, expanding to a huge feature space, huge high dimensional feature space, lots of different cross products you can add. But the cost of computing this kernel function doesn't change or almost doesn't change because you're really, the cost is just computing the dot product, adding one and then raising to an integer power, which doesn't get more expens uh, expensive depending on, uh, like if D is two or D is 100, doesn't matter for the uh, cost of computing this function. And yet, if you set D to the power of four and you stick it into this support vector machine algorithm that I showed you earlier, suddenly you're not fitting in your linear space, you're fitting in your massively high dimensional space for the same price of computation. Uh, some functions are even uh, uh, project into an infinitely dimensional space. Uh, in all honesty, I don't, I couldn't tell you why that's the case for this one, but uh, this is called an RBF kernel. Basically, you take the distance between A and B, not the dot product, but the distance between them, and you fit this kind of Gaussian uh, Bell function over them, which is what the exponent times negative distance does. Uh, so that just gives you a basic distance function, which behaves like a kernel. And that uh, supposedly fits you, uh, gives you an infinite dimensional feature space. And if you use an RBF kernel, you do really see this. It, well, it's very prone to overfitting, so it's a very powerful model. Um, so that's one thing you can do with kernels, but you can, do, you can go even further. If you have data that is not or does not originally come in features, like uh, text, for instance, or DNA or protein sequences, you can actually define a kernel on top of your text. So you can take something like string edit distance and work that around a little bit so that it behaves like a kernel and use that directly into your, in your support vector machine algorithm. So this is good for the bioinformaticians uh, in the audience. Uh, so this gives you, without extracting any literal features, this transports your data directly into a feature space onto which you can fit an SVM. Uh, or if your graphs, if your input is graphs, then there's something called a Weisfeiler Lehmann distance, which also allows you to build a kernel directly onto the graph. So you're not extracting features, you're just projecting your raw data directly into this high dimensional feature space without actually computing the high dimensional features. Uh, so that's all very complicated, but if you want to do it, it's all very simple. It just looks like this in sklearn. Make sure to normalize your data. That's important with support vector machines. Um, so that's the kernel trick. It's not very fashionable anymore these days, but it is good to know you might run into it and it might be useful for your problem. So just the last word of uh, conclusion. Why did neural networks then come back? if support vector machines are so nice and they have these magical, infinitely high-dimensional feature spaces. 
Uh, I think one big part of the problem was that you, to use support vector machines with this kernel trick, your training time is quadratic because you need to look at all pairs of points in your data, which gives you, so if the size of your data is n, you need to go n by n. So that's a quadratic training time, O n. Whereas with a neural network, you need to do just a number of these epochs, number of passes over your data. And you need to do a lot of passes over your data, so it still takes a long time. But ultimately, if you do k uh, passes over the data, the function kn grows less quick than the function n squared. So once your data grows quick enough, you reach this point where after a certain point of data, it just becomes impossible to train a support vector machine, and it's still very possible to train a neural network. And at some point, we reached that point, somewhere around 2005. We started to reach that point. And there's still, you can also train, uh, as we saw, support vector machines by gradient descent, but then you sort of start losing sight of this kernel trick, and you start thinking, well, maybe we need to move back to neural networks and feature extraction, a trainable feature extraction. Uh, and hardware caught up, so that allowed us to reach this point. And finally, machine learning culture changed. Machine learning culture during the SVM days was very much focused on if you wanted to publish something, you also had to prove that it converged. You had to prove that the loss function was convex, and you have to give guarantees that it was a learnable thing or that it performed well. And the culture shifted a little bit for these neural networks to the point where you had to show that it worked for a specific data set. But it was sort of OK to say, it works, but I don't quite know why it works yet. Um, and sometimes that's an important, uh, uh, an important impediment if everything has to work and you have to know why it works. Then sometimes research slows down a lot. And once we finally stopped uh, doing that and then allowed ourselves to say, well, this works, but we don't know why it works yet, uh, it, opened a, it, it opened up the field to, to the use of all these uh, neural network models. And they came back in a big way and allowed us to do this kind of classification, which is what we're going to talk about next Monday. So I'll see you then, and have a nice weekend. <laughs>